I remember a book that I was reading back around the year 2000. Y'all still remember the year 2000? That's just 20 years ago. It don't seem like it, does it? Many have forgotten, but there was this sort of general unrest around the year of 2000. Yeah, some of y'all will remember that. Everybody was thinking that the computers aren't going to turn over, that there's going to be a mass hysteria in the streets, uh, that there'll be all these things shutting down. You won't be able to go out and buy and sell. And all these different things was coming to mind. Everybody was thinking it's the end of the world when the year hits 2000, right? But in the midst of all that, there was this book that was very popular. It's called Left Behind. Some of y'all remember that book? Some of Anybody read it? Somebody might have read that book, Left Behind. Uh, it was about the return of Jesus. And up until about that time, I had never really studied into it. I mean, in the year 2000, I, I, I'm a different person than I am today, I'll tell you. But in the year 2000, I hadn't studied much into it. But I began to read this book. All I'd ever heard was what I'd heard in church, just vague little things that, that somebody would talk about, about how the Lord was, was coming back and He was going to return and people were going to disappear in the blink of an eye, right? There was something going to happen and then there's going to be this trouble come upon the world. And you know, I just had these vague ideas of all those things. And I began to read that book about that. And at that time, I wasn't living as close to the Lord as I should have been, really. I, I mean, we attended church. I wasn't getting into any vile, terrible things. But I wasn't living as close to the Lord as I should have been. And I read that book. And I read about how the rapture is going to take place. That it could happen at any moment. That the Lord could just appear uh, just like that, and everyone around you would disappear if you were left behind. And it caused me to get a little nervous as I read in that book, a fictional book about a real life event that is coming. A lot of people don't believe in the rapture nowadays. Did you know that? There's a lot of people that say that there ain't going to be a rapture. It's going to happen. You're going to go through the judgment of the Lord. You're going to, uh, there's going to be a yo-yo rapture, I like to call it. It says right when the Lord comes back, you're going to go, whoo boom you know. I, I don't believe none of that nonsense. I believe the rapture comes first. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches if you study out to see if these things be so. If Jesus was going to come back, I mean right now, Right at this very moment, in the midst of all this trouble and tribulation, would you be ready? Imagine if we were sitting here right now, and he was to return, just like that. And that's how it's quick a twinkling of an eye hits, you know it? Just like that. And you looked up, and the next thing you knew, there was people around you all gone. And all you was was sitting here in the midst of this church. Or maybe you hear it, you're online right now, and you hear it. And you hear uh, that everybody's disappeared because of notifications come across. Strangely, people all across the world have disappeared from the earth. We don't know what's happened. Would you be ready? Are you ready? Have you done everything that the Lord wanted you to do with your life? Because even if the rapture doesn't happen today, you could go down this driveway, go out on this road, and you could be gone in the blink of an eye. Just like that. He could return personally for you. Or he could return for his church. But I promise you that date is coming. Okay? Amen. And you need to be ready. Amen. You need to be prepared for what's about to occur. And I, I read that book and I began to get a little nervous thinking about that. In the fact, because around the year 2000, like I said, there was all this tribulation, all these trials and troubles going on all around us. And we were all thinking, you know, the end of the world could happen any minute. And I think that same kind of atmosphere is hit now, right? At this time in 2020, this will probably go down as the worst year in the history of mankind. Well, until the rapture hits, right? Uh, I, I saw something recently online, a meme that says, well, what chapter of Revelation are we doing today in 2020, right? Well, friends, I don't get past that fourth chapter, okay? You understand? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about right there, don't you? I don't get past that fourth chapter in Revelation. I'm right here and I'm in that third chapter right now. I'm a sitting and I'm a waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're doing a chapter of Revelation after chapter 4, you're in trouble. And that's what these people in 2 Thessalonians were worried about. 
They were concerned that the raptures already take place. I'm in Revelation chapter 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. Lord, I'm getting kind of nervous here. Am I, as, the, as the Lord come back, because people were uh, false teaching, they were telling these type of things. And, and thinking about the fact in the midst of tribulation in this world should make us all take a close look at how much we really believe what this Bible says, okay? How much is it inside of you and made a difference in who you are? Are you different than you were just a few years ago? Has God made a difference in you? Amen. Today I want you to turn over in 2 Thessalonians about this church that was awaiting the return of Jesus and was concerned that they might have been left behind. And Paul is going to show them what makes a rapture-ready church. It says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus, that's Silas, and Timotheus, that's Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians. The Second Thessalonians is one of the earliest books written in the New Testament. You know, we've got it lined up, the Gospels and then the letters and, and the Acts and all this different stuff in the Bible. But, but those were written at different times. And many people believe Second Thessalonians and First Thessalonians are one of the first books that were ever written in the Bible. I don't know. We can't verify that for certain. But isn't it interesting, they were talking about the return of the Lord immediately as they began to write down things about the New Testament. That was the first thing that came to their mind. And Paul had written in this letter to these believers to remind them to be ready for the return of the Lord in the rapture in this second letter to the Thessalonians because they were concerned, as I said, that the rapture had already taken place. My ch church, my hope is that there will be no regular attendee that will knock on that door the Sunday after the rapture. My, that's my hope and my prayer that everybody that sat under uh, the preaching of me and Brother Bud over these past several years that there won't be one soul That'll be coming and knocking on that door. Because the Lord had already opened the door and let the true believers up. You understand? On that day after that rapture. And I want and I pray that there'll not be one soul there. But I imagine that there'll be some churches in that day they'll not miss a beat. There won't be a difference take place whatsoever. Uh, the, the newspaper report that millions across the globe have disappeared without a trace and people will just show up doing church as usual. The pastor will show up with his sermon, walk on in the door, preach to a full congregation, and the Lord done took the church home, right? Amen. I pray that doesn't ever happen here. I pray that. I pray that doesn't occur. But Paul knew this church's concern. So what he does here is he begins right here in the opening of this book to try to lay out to them what it looks like for a church that won't knock on the door uh, after the rapture. But what like that looks like, what a rapture-ready church is. And I want you to ask yourself this morning, because the church isn't just a building, the church is the people. The church is the people gathered together. I want you to ask yourself individually, is this who I am? As Paul lays this out to us here in 2 Thessalonians. Am I ready? That if he returned at any moment, I'd be ready to go. Because we need to be ready. Listen to what it says here. What does the rapture ready church look like? It says this church unto the church in the Thessalonians. In God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear what it said there, church? It said that this group, their description of this church was they were in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you in God this morning? Are you in God? Are you in the church? Are you a saved membership this morning? This is how you know you're saved. You are in the beloved. Does it thrill your heart to be able to come here and worship the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Amen. Does it excite you to know that I get to come in here and praise the Lord God? Amen. Does it thrill you to open up this Bible in the mornings, turn through its pages, and hear the words of God Himself speaking down to you? Are you in Him? Is He in you? 2 Peter 1.4 says this. It says, Whereby are we given to us exceeding great and precious promises. The Lord said when you bowed down the knee and you said, I'm going to follow you, He'd save you, didn't He? He said He'd make you a new creature. That by these you might be partakers, it says, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Let me explain that to you in southern English. The Lord done rubbed off on you. You hear what I'm saying? 
He rubbed off on you. You're different. You know, the people you spend your time with, they rub off on you. Their atmosphere, their mannerisms, who they are and how they act, that rubs off on you. And if you're spending your time in the Lord and the Lord's inside of you, then He's going to rub off on you. I'm going to be able to look at you and I'm going to see Jesus in your eyes this morning, okay? As you're talking, I'm going to hear the words of God pouring out of your mouth, right? Your words are going to go away as He draws closer inside of you. Are you different? Would people mistake you for Jesus on the street? I'm not talking about that idea of this long-haired, blue-eyed fellow. I'm talking about Jesus, folks. Has he made a difference? Do that, does, does people see Jesus in you? Are you a partaker of the divine nature? Because some people don't like the Jesus. I, I tell you, it makes them upset. There's people online. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll speak what, what the Word of God says. It makes them mad. You know what? It get, does anybody ever get mad at you for being a partaker of the divine nature? But does anybody uh, uh, honor that, admire that, that you're a partaker of the divine nature? But folks, I tell you what, uh, they, there ought to be something going on there. There should be a difference from what happened before, right? They should see Jesus in you. Galatians 2.20 says this. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Well, I don't remember being there on that cross, do you? I don't remember being on that cross, but it says I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. He's in you. you say, he, he was in me when I walked in. Yes, if you're a saved individual, when you walked in, the Lord Jesus Christ said, you know where else He is? He's down wherever you go to. He's down there at that eating place. He's down there at that uh, school. He's down there at that workplace. He's in you walking around. With, are, are you making him mourn inside as he walks around inside of you? And the life, it says, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. He loved me and gave himself. He lives through me. You, you get the point here, right? We are the hands and feet of Christ in this world. Uh, Jesus said, the greater works than these you'll do. I sit here and think, well, how am I going to do greater works? He walked across the water. He, he fed 5,000. He brought people back to life. My goodness, how can we do greater works? He's talking about the multiplication in that aspect, isn't he? All over the world, there's supposed to be little Jesus all over the place making a difference. And Paul starts out here right away and saying, this is who you are in Christ. This is why... If you're in Christ, if Christ is in you, then it'll bother you when that, that word comes out your mouth. That idea, that thought. I'm not just talking about what they call the dirty words. I'm talking about the, the, the ideas and thoughts that come out your mouth. The things that come out of you. What comes out of you? Are they the things that would come out of Jesus? Or are they things that would come out of a sinner that ain't never known Jesus? Uh, this is why when that thing that goes by your eyes... It causes you to get concerned. There's things that go by my eyes shouldn't go by my eyes sometimes. And I get concerned about that because I saw that. If you're not concerned about that, there might be a problem. Th this is why when that thought runs through your head, it bothers you. Something disturbs you about that thought that runs because Christ is in you. Folks, I tell you what, if you want to be rapture ready, you better make sure that Christ is in you. All right? You better be sure. If it doesn't bother you, you need to be really... If it doesn't bother you, you need to be on this altar right now before I even get to the invitation, okay? Come and lay your head on down because I tell you, he could come at any moment in the twinkling of an eye. The next thing he says here, if you're in Christ, there will be something that comes out of you. First of all, you will be filled with faith. Look here what it says in verse 3. It says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Amen. If you've been saved, your faith will grow. There will be a difference. These people's faith was growing. I am not the same man who read that book that was disturbed about left behind back in 2000 as I am in 2020. The Lord has grown my faith over that time. Not in myself, but in Him. I have faith in my Lord Jesus Christ that He will accomplish what He said He was going to do. There are precious promises. He said that He's going to take me to glory one day, and I trust Him. Amen. And because of that, I trust Him in everything else as well. 
I have learned to lay these things in his hand. It amazes me so much that people are so comfortable saying, I'm going to trust the Lord on my de- that I'm, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But I don't trust him about anything else he says in that book, right? I don't trust him about, about giving or going to church or, or any of these different things. I don't trust him about that. But I'm going to trust him because uh, you know what that is? That's a lie of the devil. The Lord's going to change you. He is. There's going to be a difference in who you are. Ponder right now with me. Where were you five years ago? I've asked this, I think, just a few months ago. Where were you five years ago in your faith? Is there a difference? Is there a change? Just a little bit. Maybe just a small amount. But is there a change five years later in who you are? And would you consider that growth or would you consider going back? I watched a television show last night with the kids uh, about this woman and her son. And they would go to church together. The woman was a devout Christian. And the son, he was a little eight-year-old atheist. And he, as the preacher would preach, uh, the boy would raise up his hand. And he'd ask all these crazy questions to the pastor. And the pastor would be like, oh, not another question. Because he would ask these crazy questions. Well, well, why in the world, if, if there's aliens out there, did Jesus die for the aliens? You know, just crazy stuff. Is, you know, we should ask questions. I believe that strengthens our faith. When we ask questions and we try to figure out what, what God has said, because I believe God has the answers, okay? But the little boy would raise his hand and he'd ask these questions in the middle of the church in front of the congregation. It was kind of a comical thing. But, but there was this child, this woman, uh, there was a child that died in the congregation. And she didn't know how to deal with that. She was disturbed by that this devout Christian woman. She was disturbed that this little, little child had died. And she was trying her best to have faith in God. But she's thinking, how could God allow this to happen? And you know, that's how we think sometimes. We think that, that God can never bring anything bad into the world. There's never any uh, reason in that. And it sounds awful to us, right? Why would God allow this to happen and different things like that? And she was saying, well, I know God has a purpose. But in this time, she begins to lose her faith. She steps away and she goes out and drinks her a beer and gets drunk and, and then she, she doesn't put her kids to bed and kiss them and pray with them before they go to bed. And then she, uh, she, she sits at the dinner table and she's sitting there and she says, you know, uh, she just starts eating. She doesn't even bless her food. And the little boy looks up and he's kind of disturbed. He says, what's going on? And, and they go out to the side and she's sitting there talking to him. And she says, well, you know, I just don't know what to do about all this. I don't understand why God would do this, and I'm having a hard time dealing with it, and I don't know how much my faith is. And the little boy said, well, I'm scared, Mama. This ain't normal. God gave me you. I don't believe in God, the little boy said, but God gave me you. Do you realize this morning how much your faith is not just important to you, and how much it's grown, it's important to everybody around you. Amen. Everybody. And that little boy, though he, and this is, a, this is a foolish comedy show, though that little boy, he, he needed her to have faith. So much that he would argue for God that she would have faith. Folks, you don't know how important you are to other people around you. Amen. You don't know how important you are because they're looking to you. And when you came up and you said, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, everybody was watching. Yeah. And they're watching to see if you're going to follow through to see if this is real. And they're depending on you to have that faith. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'll give you that faith. You be faithful to the end. You say, oh, my, my, my son, my child, my, 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 my father, my mother, they don't believe in God. They don't want it, but they're looking to you. Okay? They're looking to you. It's important that we don't just throw everything away because a trial or a trouble or a tribulation comes into our life. We are an example to this whole world. When you took up on the name Christian, it has Christ right there in the center, doesn't it? Folks, are you filled with faith? That's what the rapture-ready church looks like. Next this, a rapture-ready church is saved, filled with faith, and filled with love. Look what it says here. 
And it says, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. The charity. This is, uh, the King James translators uh, chose this very wisely. This isn't, they use charity because this is a type of love that isn't just, uh, I, you, I give it to you and you give it back to me. This is the type of love that you give out and you don't expect it back in return. This is agape love, is what the Greek says. Agape love. And when I look around this room today, is there anybody in this room, of your brothers and sisters, that you don't love? Maybe online right now. Is there anybody that you don't love that's of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Folks, the Bible says that we are to have this agape love. Not the love that says, well, you're good to me, I'll be good to you. But the love that says, I'll be good to you regardless. Because what did Jesus do? What did he do? I remember an old boy that used to go out and get drunk every night who used to uh, run the bars and all these different things. And I know that Jesus died for him in the midst of that. When he wouldn't come to church, when he was scared to sit in the back pew back here and keep his head down because somebody told him he had to go to church. I remember that Jesus loved me, okay? He loved me. And even in the midst of all of that, He showed me charity. He showed me love. He showed me agape, didn't He? And that's what happened to me when I received Him. He made me new. And I grew in that faith and I grew in that love that you can love even your enemies. Amen. I've seen churches where they couldn't, they couldn't love their friends, let alone their enemies, okay? That's, that's, not, that's the kind of church that will show up the day after the rapture. Okay? There's no love there. I'm thankful we got a good loving church here. Amen. I truly am. I tell you what, we just don't know how blessed we are to have the love and fellowship that we have here in this church. We really don't know. But Jesus, that's what He did for me. Not only are we to be filled with faith and filled with love, listen to it, filled with hope. Look what it says here in verse 4. It says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. You know, there's a lot of people uh, that's angry today. I mean, they're so angry, they, they think they're being persecuted because there is a statue on the street next to them that they don't like, that they heard 500 years ago that something happened and they didn't like what they did. And they'll tear down these statues, won't they? All over. And, and I ain't saying they ain't some statues probably need to be set aside, but I tell you this, I think it's kind of foolish, don't you? I think there's a lot of foolishness going on. Uh, others are angry because uh, they've been inconvenienced in some way or another because of uh, all this uh, disease running all rampant through our society. Uh, well, I, I tell on this mask, and that means it's the mark of the beast. You know I've heard that. They said that this is the entryway to the mark of the beast by putting these masks on and different things and doing all this stuff. Well, I tell you what, I don't have to worry about the mark of the beast, okay? Because the rapture's coming, ain't it? I, won't, I don't have to worry about anybody putting uh, what some people think is a little chip in my hand. I don't have to worry about nobody putting a little tattoo on my hand. I don't have to worry about none of that nonsense because I'm going to be gone. Amen. All right? Amen. <laughs> Why do these people get so worried about the mark of the beast when you ain't even going to be here, okay? Could it be that they're worried about it because they don't know what the Bible says? Now, I ain't saying I ain't got frustrated about a lot of different things in society. I do. I get frustrated. But we've never faced the persecution that these Thessalonians faced. And these were young believers. Young believers. I mean, they just, uh, just a couple of years had known Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And let me tell you the persecution they faced. Their property was being seized away from them. Why? Because they said they'd follow Jesus. Their, their workers were stopping them from practicing their trades. Why? Because they said they'd follow Jesus. They were shunned by their families for trusting Christ. And they may be some of us here shunned by our families for trusting Christ. But they shunned them so far that they'd have them killed. Okay? Some were insulted. Some were beaten. Some were put to death. And they were spirits in the suffering of the worst kind. But Paul is deeply concerned for these young Christians. Now here's the thing. Some of us have been following Jesus for a long time. And yet the least little thing will bother us. The least little thing, right? And we don't look at it like, I know Jesus is coming back. You can throw whatever you want on me. You know, the government in America might go straight to hell out here around us, but I got Jesus. This ain't my true home anyway, all right? <laughs> 
And it, 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 in the trajectory it's in right now, unless God brings revival on the United States of America, that's straight where it's going. And I tell you, I've got a place I'm going. You see, we imagine that if we're following Jesus, we ain't going to have no more troubles. That's American Christianity right there, ain't it? Oh, yeah, we ain't going to have no trouble, no trial, no tribulation. Nobody going to, you know, everything's going to be fine, Daisy. But I look in the Word of God and I see John 16, 33. It says, in this world you'll have trouble, right? I look over at Matthew 10, 22, and I say, you'll be hated by all men because of me. Y'all hate it? I, some people hate me. I'll just be honest with you. They, some people hate me. You will be handed over and persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 9. Uh, the time has come, in Je uh, it was said, that when anyone who kills you will think they are offering service to God, John 16, 2. Uh, Acts 14, 22 says we must go through many hardships to enter in the kingdom of God, doesn't it? And, and 2 Timothy 3, 12 says that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, right? Except you're, unless you're American. <laughs> Yeah, right. Unless you're a Baptist. No, come on. Let's get it straight. We're going to face trouble. We're going to face things we can't understand. That we can't comprehend. Are you filled with hope, though? Are you filled with hope that you know that no matter what they do to this old body, I'm going home? Amen. Are you filled with hope today? Are you looking up for your redemption draweth nigh? That's what I look at when I think about the troubles and trials and tribulations around us. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Finally here, are you kingdom marked? Look what it says here in verse 5. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. See, a manifest token is plain evidence. This is plain. If you have uh, the faith and the love and, and the hope because you're genuinely saved, th then that's a manifest token that God has saved you. Okay? You're rapture ready. You're prepared right here, right now, to go up to be with Him. And you know, a lot of people, as I said, they're worried about the mark of the beast today. I, I, I thought about that. There was a guy on Twitter. He wrote up, How can all these people who say they believe in the pre-tribulation rapture be worried about the mark of the beast? They ain't never going to see it, right? But everybody seems to have that mindset in their mind. They don't understand what they believe. You know what I'm concerned about? What every one of us should be. The mark of Christ, not the mark of the beast. Amen. Do you have the mark of Christ on your life? Are you different? Do you fill with faith and hope and love? Some of us may be concerned that we're not rapture ready this morning. I'm honest now. Listen here. Death ain't nothing. All right? You hear me? Death is just the entryway into the next world. The most important thing is what happens after death. We spend our entire lives worrying. A lot of us, we, we try to put it in our back of our mind that death ain't coming. But death is coming. The rapture's coming too. Many of us may face death before the rapture. But it's coming. There is a point in time that it's coming and you need to be ready, right? I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube. But I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.